We worship you, Jesus. Amen. There is no other name like your name, God. You have a delivering name, a powerful name, a name that gives victory over anything and everything in this world. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Amen. My scripture setting this evening, I'm not going to have you turn there, but it's in Psalm 122, verse 1. I really just want to get right into it, but it has to do what we're, we're experiencing right now. It says, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord if you would just pray with me and lift up his name, Lord Jesus, we thank you, God, for what we are feeling in this place. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity that we have to be in your house. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that we can worship you like we heard in the song unashamedly, that we can do it, Lord, with our whole heart, with our whole mind, with our whole soul. I ask, Lord Jesus, that you would help me, that you would anoint me, that you would help me to preach what is here today, and that you would help, Lord, the ears and the hearts and the minds and the souls that are here to be able to lord receive it in your wonderful and matchless name in jesus name we pray amen you may be seated let's give the lord a hand clap of praise he is worthy amen as i read earlier it said this was the psalmist david saying i was glad when they said unto me let us go into the house of the Lord. You see, David was glad at the very invitation to go into the house of the Lord. And as you are here this, this evening, I can see that you're glad, you're happy. You're, it's, there's a sense of satisfaction, of joy that only you and I might get to know if we're in this place. The prospect of going to where God's presence dwelt caused David to just brighten up and rejoice within himself. This psalmist is the same one who said, for a day in thy courts, in Psalm 84 is better than a thousand. He said, I'd rather just be even a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. He'd rather have worked as a doorkeeper at the entrance of God's house near the presence of God than to dwell within a tent in the presence of the wicked. He would have rather labored and just been that much closer to God than to say, you know what? I have the satisfaction of knowing that I have a roof over my head, but I'm surrounded on wicked, by wickedness on all sides. David had an appreciation for the work of the Lord. And then finally, one of my favorite scriptures is Psalm 27, 4, and it says, again, he says, One thing have I desired of the Lord, and that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. The one thing that David desired was to dwell. Otherwise establish a residence within the house of the Lord. He wanted to be where God was. And we're, we're a people who want to be where God is. We want to be in his presence. We want his presence to go with us as we go through the day. We want to go with him wherever he's directing us, leading us. And, it, and David had... A very correct mindset. He, he wasn't one to just say, I'll have just this little portion. He said, you know, while I'm asking, I'm just going to kind of make this a run on sentence, so to speak, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. He, he knew that if I even get inside the house, that if I'm inside the house, then I can be able to see him. I can behold the beauty of the Lord. If I can maybe even just get close face to face, then now I can talk to him face to face. He was progressive in his thinking of getting close to the presence of God. That's my goal. I want to be able to get close to the presence of God. I, I enjoy being in his house. And I know that you don't just get to feel what you're feeling here, here. And if you only feel what you feel here, then you got to rethink that and start to make that happen at home. Because this can happen at home. You can have a time of worship when you're listening to those CDs. You can have a time of prayer and the, and the tears begin to stream down your face. You can have a time of opening up the word and it seems like it's preaching right to you and it just opens 
up to you like, like none other. It doesn't just happen in church. But what I want to bring a point on is there is a value to the house of the Lord. There is a value of us being here. You see, we understand and we value the house of the Lord. If anybody does, it's the people who are already here. From what we can understand of David, he was a man who understood, he valued, and he enjoyed the things of God. He wanted to be in God's presence. He wanted to see God face to face. But even beyond that, he wanted to inquire. He wanted to question. He wanted to ask. He wanted to learn of the Lord. He also, if you were to go through the scripture, he had a, a, an affinity and a love and an appreciation for the things of the priesthood, the prophets, uh, the Ark of the Covenant. He had an interest in God's current dwelling place and future dwelling place, the tabernacle to the temple transition. You could see that he had a, a, a taste and a, and a desire and a want for the things of God. This man, after God's own heart, recognized that there was a blessing associated with those who dwelt in God's house. And tonight, there are those that are here who agree with David. We see the value of coming together, or else you wouldn't be here. This would be a much emptier building. But you value something that happens here. You value something that takes place in this place. You understand the effect and you enjoy what happens in the house of the Lord. You do. And I, I applaud you for that. I, I, I commend you for what you do in being able to come to the house of the Lord. That is honorable. That is a great and glorious thing. I, I hope that you get it.
anointed of word of God is preached or when a song of adoration is sung. We understand the necess necessity of godly fellowship, especially in these final days. We're the ones who understand the beauty of holiness in modesty, in moderation, in separation, and we value the one God message. We are the people who understand the blessing associated with stewardship, and we understand the move and operation of God's spirit as he ministers within a congregation people in this world do not understand that they don't see it like we see it they don't know it like we know it they don't feel it like we feel it because they don't have access to the house of the Lord like we do they haven't entered into his holy place like we have they haven't come to a place yet where they can open those doors in the spiritual and walk through and feel him like we do we are privileged you are a privileged people you are truly the royal priest the holy nation the separate you are privileged you don't see everybody getting to feel like you do or walking like you walk without a spiritual weight upon their shoulders i don't know how people live in this world without jesus frankly i don't i barely make it with jesus some days and if you say, oh, I can't, believe you me, you'll have your day. <laughs> and I'll be praying for you. <laughs> but as I continue to say here, we get glad like David did when we are given an invitation to once again enter into the house of the Lord. His very presence. Simply put, we understand the apostolic Pentecostal church culture and we appreciate and value it. We understand it. We know it. We, when, when somebody goes a uh, loopy on the floor over here and they're dancing it up and, and their hands and their feet are going every which way, that blesses our spirit. But for someone else, they may see that is crazy. That is weird. That is strange. That is obscure. That is different. That is peculiar. But wait a second. These words are just to, dis to describe us. That's who we are. That's who we are supposed to be. That's okay. Maybe they just don't understand quite yet, but they're interested. And that's what I want to bring to you today. There are people in this world that are interested in what we have. And we have the most privileged thing upon the face of the earth to be in the very presence of God. But it's not enough just for us to experience it, but it's to let someone else know. David said... Let us go into the house of the Lord. He said, I was glad when they said unto me, I was glad. Well, there are some people that are waiting for some gladness to come into their life. They have some expectation. They're looking in and they're saying, what does he have? What does she have? She has something that I don't have. He has something I don't have. And I want that. I want that in my heart. He has joy. He has peace. He has love. He has life and life more abundant. I want that. I don't understand it. I want it though. You have the privilege of the anointing of God. You have the privilege of the blood upon your life. You have the privilege of the presence of God surrounding you at all moments of the day. But it's not enough for you just to enjoy it. Today is the day of salvation. And today is the day of invitation. Now is the moment for us to reach. To reach out and to let someone know, you know what? You want a little gladness in your life? You want a little change in your life? Let us go into the house of the Lord. I get a little excited when I come to the house of God. I don't know about you, but I came from a church of about 30 people. This platform was bigger than the sanctuary and the entirety of the congregation building that I came from. But we'd have church and we'd come at it. And I love this church. And we come with an expectation just like that home church that I came from. And that's what kept me here through the hard times and the difficult times. Is I see, saw people that love the word and they love the presence of God. And if they love those things, then I'm going to make this work. And it kept me. And those things have held on to me through thick and through thin. And we know the value of the word. We're a church that knows the value of the word. 
But if we can ever get a hold of the Spirit of God and His presence and the move that it can make in the difficult times and in the strenuous times of, of life, and we allow it to lead us and guide us like never before, there will be supernatural things that happen. Miracles will begin to take place. Tongues and interpretations, prophecies that go forth, things that begin to minister, to preach forth into the hearts and minds, not just of the people in this church. The Spirit gifts were not just meant for inside the church, but they were helping us to be able to discern and to be able to minister and to work with people outside of the church as well. They came in contact with spiritual things outside of the church. There had to be a casting out of devils and there had to be a discerning of spirits when Paul cast out the demoniacs, the, the spirits out of the woman who was prophesying about who they were. That happened outside of a church service. That happened outside. And that's what I'm waiting for. And I'm praying. And I'm fasting. And I'm giving over whatever I can to be able to see that happen. And I'm going to keep inviting. And I'm going to keep giving what I have. And I'm going to be glad every time I come with an expectation to the house of the Lord. The reason we understand and that we value the things of God is because we have become a part of the household of God. The reason you appreciate the things of God is because you are in the house of God. Otherwise, we have become residents of the house of God just as David had desired. To be honest, I did not appreciate and value quite my mother and father's home until after I left my father and mother's home. I came back that first Christmas and I said, Mother, Father, I lived in a palace. This place is majestic. And my parents looked around like, what are you talking about? But I loved it. I understood the value of the house that I was in. And I valued the things that were in that house. There was a sofa. Can I, can I get an amen from the students? You know what I'm talking about the first time you see a kitchen. And you see a stove. And you see a microwave. And you're like... God is in this place. And the microwave isn't the only cooking device in that room. Oh, that is a blessed thing. But why did you become appreciative of it? Because you were engaged with it. You began to see what you had and then you saw what others did not. We see what this world does not have. And we see what we have. It says in Ephesians 2.19. Now therefore, ye are no more strangers and foreigners. We used to be strangers. We used to be foreigners. We used to be outside of this family of God. But now we are fellow citizens with the saints. And we are of the household of God. We've become a part of the house. We've, be, we've set up residence. We have begun to dwell as David desired. He said, one thing I have a desire, that, that I might dwell in the house of the Lord. That's what he wanted. It's like, if I can have one thing, God, I'm going to dwell in your presence. And he said, and while I'm there, I'm going to get closer to your face so I can behold it. And then I can be able to talk to you. He said, I'm going to progress in my relationship with you. It's not going to just stagnate right there. But he said that he became a house, that we are the household of God. Now, when I was in high school, I didn't understand the physical demands and value of the sacrifice of a wrestler until after I became one. Before entering Bible college, I didn't understand and value the education I was about to receive until after I had experienced it. In the last year, I didn't truly understand the role of being a husband until after I became one. In the last few months, I didn't understand the responsibility of being a parent until I had my son Micah. Also, I didn't understand and value the things of God until I had had an experience with God in the house of God. It was only after I had become engaged with those very things that I actually appreciated them. Does that make sense? Now, many people want to be able to have the things of God without ever being in the house of God. But you can't get the things of God unless you're in the house of God because God's things are in his house. Just so you know. And that was free. That's not in my notes. But we get that out of our minds. We don't have that here. But with all of this in mind, my goal is my, my, my 
point of this message is not to bring forth that, yes, we need to be in it, but to let others know that they can be in it as well. There is a world that doesn't understand, they don't value, and they don't enjoy what we have because they simply do not understand. They have not had the opportunity to experience it like we have. They might see it. They might have a glimpse. They might be Lutheran. They might be Catholic. They might be Episcopalian. They might be Baptist. They may have been baptized and they felt the refreshing of what it was when they went under in maybe the Trinity. But they don't know quite yet like we know. But they're interested and they're hungry and they're desirous. And I, I give God all the glory for the experience that they have had. But we have such a wonderful opportunity that we have that yet they still have not tasted. And I want them to taste of it. I want them to see of it. They may get a glimpse from the outside wondering, but they await an invitation. David said he was glad when. David's gladness was dependent upon the invitation. Like David, there are those who are waiting the invite. The gladness of their life is dependent on an invitation to the house of the Lord. Their gladness, their change, their rejoicing is dependent on an invitation. They can't necessarily feel like they can invite themselves. Have you ever just, you know, there might be some of you that invite yourself over to people's houses. Please don't raise your hand. But who here has ever felt awkward trying to invite themselves over to someone else's house that you don't really know? It's like a new person. I know you guys do. It's true. And if you don't have that awkwardness, we need to talk. It's that new person you've never known. Well, let's say this person's name is Jesus. And you don't know who they are. But you want to get to know them. And you have a friend that knows that friend. How are you going to get to know him? You are hoping and craving an invitation. You see all that Jesus has in his house. He's got the finest toys. Jesus has the finest things. Jesus lives like a king. And everybody that interacts with Jesus lives like a king. Everybody that works and lives and, and hangs out with Jesus has it good. They have joy, they have peace, they have love, they have happiness, they have all these wonderful things. And they see that. Those are the things of God. They're like, man, he's eating off of the table the fruit of the Spirit. And here I'm eating off of, of top ramen sort of things in the world. Like, this is garbage. They, they're desiring something more. They want something more. But they're awaiting an invitation. Now, there was such a man who was awaiting an invitation, and his name was Zacchaeus. And we can read about him in Luke chapter 19, verses 2 through uh, 10. But it's starting in verse uh, 2, it says, And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, which was the chief among the publicans. That means he was the biggest and baddest man in town. The publicans were kind of an unruly group of people. If they said it, it went. They had the monopoly on everything that was happening. He was rich. He sought to see Jesus, who he was. He wanted to know who Jesus was. And he could not for the press because he was little of stature. He was, he was short. He could not be able to see. And therefore, he ran before and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him. He wanted to see Jesus. For he knew that Jesus was to pass that way. Now, Zacchaeus was a man who desired to know about Jesus. We got that. He made an effort to see who Jesus was. We got that. And because of his personal shortcomings, you see what I did there? He could not see all that he desired to see. And there are many who are just like that. This man made this his best effort to place himself in a position where he could see Jesus. Now, let's apply this. There are those who desire to know about Jesus. They are making an effort and they're positioning themselves to see who he is. They ask questions. They bring up the topics. They begin to take note of some changes they need to make. They share with you the deeper things of their life. They desire to see 
Jesus for who he is. But because of their own personal shortcomings, they can't quite fully know him as they would like to. They have an inhibition. They have something holding them back. They have some personal problems. They have some issues of their own. Some things that they can't even change in themselves. But they desire to know Jesus. Now, this is the case with your neighbor, your coworker, your boss, your classmate, your teacher, your family member, your fishing buddy, your book club buddy, your shopping buddy, and your hunting buddy. Whoever that person is, they are in that situation. They got Zacchaeus syndrome. They want to know more about Jesus. They're asking more about Jesus. They want to know a little bit more about Jesus. They kind of, they're kind of doing one of these. They're putting themselves in places and in opportunities to be able to speak with you. They linger in the break room a few seconds longer just so that they can tag in with you. That's what I'm talking about. And we need to be a little more spiritually aware or just have some common sense and see these people are hungry. There are people on every side of us that are hungry, that are wanting what we have. And we have the privilege of knowing the presence of God and they see that and they want it but they want an invitation and they'll be so happy and they'll be so glad when they get one they will these people see the Jesus inside of you and they want to get a hold of what you have they desire the things of God but never have had the opportunity to experience the house of God and if you can't even get into his presence, how can you experience his things? If you can't even get close to him, how can you experience joy? If you can't get close to him, how can you experience peace? If you can't get close to him, how can you experience true love? If you can't get close to him, how can you experience any of those things? You can't. It goes on to say in verses 5 through 6, And when Jesus came to the place, remember where Zacchaeus had positioned himself, he looked up and saw him, that is Zacchaeus, and said to him, Zacchaeus, he said, make haste. He said, get ready and come down, for today I must abide at thy house. Now, Jesus had no problem inviting himself over to other people's houses. And he made haste, that is Zacchaeus, and he came down and received him, what does it say? Joyfully. A synonym for joyfully. He became glad. That's what happened when he had an invitation from Jesus. The saint, David, a man of God, a man who praised and worshipped, he, like us, became glad with an expectation we came to the house of God. The sinner, a publican, a person who is the downright, the people that were hated of the Jews, even amongst the Jews, this person also became glad at an invitation to come into the presence of God. Sinner and saint become glad when they come into the presence of God and when they have the invitation to come into his presence. But people's gladness is dependent on us giving them an invitation to know Jesus. It will be de very difficult for you and I to be glad if we can't get close to Jesus. It'll be very difficult for others to get glad and actually truly feel satisfied until they get an invitation to know Jesus Christ. Someone is waiting. Someone is waiting for you to invite them to the house of of the Lord to be in God's presence. They desire, they know, they've been asking the questions, they've been annoying you at work. They come at you and they talk to you and they want to know what you got. But they're waiting an invitation. You see, Zacchaeus the sinner came down from the sycamore tree and joined Jesus simply because of an invitation. Without an invitation, how would have he how would have he felt welcomed to really know Jesus? The Samaritan woman at the well brought her family and friends to meet Jesus at Jesus' request. Jesus recognized her thirst. Not just for the water that she came to that day at the well for, but there was a spiritual thirst that he recognized within her for the things of God. And we need to be just like that, recognizing that within people. And people came simply... She gathered the people, her friends and family that were in the city at Jesus' request. Because of an invitation, they came. 
without an invitation, how would have they known of this man called Jesus? The 12 disciples put aside their professions, their interests, their desires, and joined Jesus because of an invitation. Without an invitation, how would have they, these men ever become disciples? How do we ever expect someone to become a disciple of Jesus Christ if they never had an invitation to become one? Philip, the evangelist, reached the Ethiopian eunuch because of an invitation he made to help the man understand the word of God. Without an invitation, how would, have, how would he have learned of his need for salvation? It wouldn't have happened without an invitation. It's not as scary as it sounds. It's really quite simple. We've been called. We've been commissioned. But now it's time to go. We can't expect anyone to ever know the things of God if we never give them the chance to come in contact with the presence of God. You are the walking, talking house of the Lord, incarnate before every person in this world. They see you, and you have the presence of God dwelling you, in you. It said in Ephesians 2.19, I read earlier, that it said that you were the household of God. Well, if you were to read further in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 20 through 22, and I don't have this in my notes, so sorry, Micah, but it continues to say this, that you become the house of God. It says, and are built upon the foundations of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. So this is how we're built up. We have the apostles, we have the prophets. They are there to support us. That's what we believe, what they preached, but also Jesus Christ is the very center of it. And then in verse 21, it says, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord. It's built all that com composition right there has created this house, this holy temple. And then in verse 22, it says, in whom ye, you, you're not just the household, but now you are the habitation of God through the Spirit. You have become the habitation. You have become the house because of the Spirit of God that has become resident in you. You have not just become resident in His presence, but His presence has become resident in you. You don't just abide in Him, but He begins to abide in you. That is what needs to happen. We have become a part of abiding in this church. We have come into the presence of God, and we are the most privileged people on the face of the earth. But it's now high time that we bring that presence, and we make it dwell. We become mobile homes, so to speak, in this world for this world to be able to come in contact with. We need to become the taco trucks that begin to deliver out what we got. And we have something beautiful. We have something great. And I might be a little funny right now, but I am true in what I'm saying. We have something that is anointed. We have something powerful. We have something that people need. And it won't get out to them without an invitation. They won't hear it unless we go out to be able to preach it. It says in Romans chapter 10, how then shall they call on him who they have not believed? How can they begin to profess and call upon God in whom they don't even know? They can't. They can't. How shall they believe in whom they have not heard? They can't. It's impossible. Impossible. It is. It can't happen. I'm sorry, but it cannot. How shall they hear without a preacher? How can people call upon Jesus if they don't believe in him? How can people believe in Jesus if they have never heard of him? How can people hear of Jesus if there isn't someone to tell them or invite them? You see, people won't reach out to Jesus unless they believe him. And people won't believe in Jesus unless they hear about him. And people won't hear about Jesus and someone like you and like me begins to tell them and invite them. Today is the day and there is somebody that's searching. There is somebody that's hungry. There's somebody that's looking. And if th this person's not working, 
All right, move on to the next one. This one here needs help. So a little here, so a little here. Some plant, some water, but you know what? God gets the increase. This place will become full because of what a, this person does and what this person does and what this person does is going to inspire this person and what this person does is going to inspire that person and it's just going to grow and grow and grow and you're going to take the seed of what they had and you're going to use it to plant and you're, they're going to take the seed of what you had and they're going to plant and it's going to continue to inspire and grow. Why? That's the law of the harvest. That's just how it works. It's a natural thing. A natural thing that, uh, that promotes a supernatural uh, mindset that we can be able to look into. It, it's just one of those things that works. It's a law of God. It's the law of the harvest. What you reap you will sow. And if you don't reap anything, if you don't sow anything, you ain't going to reap anything. That's just how it is. I give a little, I get a little. I give nothing, I get nothing. I give my all. Oh, I'm waiting to see what God gives. I'm waiting to see what God gives. I'm waiting to see what only he can do. As I close here tonight, and yes, I am finishing I want to do just one more thing. Stand up tonight if you have ever received healing while in the house of the Lord. If you've ever received a healing while you were in the house of the Lord, stay standing. Stand up tonight if you have ever received deliverance while in the house of the Lord. Stand up tonight if you have received an answered prayer while in the house of the Lord. Stand up tonight if you have ever received direction while in the house of the Lord. Stand up tonight if you received the Holy Ghost for the first time while in a church service in the house of the Lord. Stand up tonight if you have ever received peace or joy or love or spiritual rest or God has provided the miraculous for you while you've been in the house of the Lord. And if that hasn't covered it, stand up if God has done even just something, some little something for you while you've been in the house of the Lord. And if I look across this place, I pretty much see that God has done something for someone at some point in time. We're privileged. We're the privileged people of God. We know the value. We understand and we enjoy it and we're glad. But somebody's gladness in their spirit is dependent upon an invitation. Somebody is dependent upon an invitation. As we look around this place at all those standing, we can see that the house of God and the things of God had made a difference in our lives. That is why we are glad to be here today. It's intimately been an experience that you've had. He's healed you. He's touched you. Maybe he's delivered you from something. He's provided something miraculous. He answered a prayer. Maybe you received a call from God. I don't know. I know what he's done for me and he's done all that and so much more. And I'm thankful for it. But I'm not satisfied for just me. I desire it for someone else because I know of what it's done for me. I used to work at this place with a bunch of, of, of Indian men and women. It was an IT recruiting and consulting business. And I helped as a secretary there and, and helping with what needed to go on and them finding people to fill in for these IT jobs. And there was a gentleman who worked there named Apurba. And Apurba would, like the moment I came into the office, the man would just latch on to me and just follow me. How are you doing, Justin? Are you going to help me with my English today? Like... My job was to help him learn better English. And I would talk with him, and we'd talk in the office, and we'd talk about God, and we'd talk about work, and we'd talk about whatever was going on that day. 
And then finally, we had a service. And I said, you know what? I, need, I, need, I just need to ask a purba. I just need to ask a purba. Purba, do you want to come to church with me? Now, mind you, the man's a Hindu. And a purba says, Justin, I have been waiting for you to ask me. And my heart broke. Because he'd been waiting for months for me just to ask him a simple question. You know what's the craziest thing? The very next week, his job got shipped out to California, and I felt, God, I, he had one Sunday that he came to this church, and then he was gone. And I felt depressed in my spirit, and I just prayed, and I said, God, I don't know what, what's going to happen. But I know that he came into the presence of God, and please forgive me for not having asked him sooner. My wife, a few months later, went to India, and she came in contact with Apurba, and he came to a Pentecostal church while, he, while she was there. God is a God of restoration. God can be able to bring people to the house of God, but they're waiting for an invitation. They're waiting for an invitation. They're expectant and they're glad and they're wanting something and they see what you have. But they're waiting. And so I want to invite you to come to this altar. We have these tickets. They say free admission on them. They don't know that this isn't a theater. But there is someone whether they're at your work, whether they're at your school, whether you see them at Caribou all the time because you're an addict. But there are people who are hungry. And there are people who really want to know what we know. And they're just waiting for an invitation. So, what I want to do is I want to first invite you. I want to invite you to come. And students, you've been praying for that one person, correct? Every chapel service for months now. You've been waiting for it to break. You've been praying. You've been crying. You've maybe been fasting. That's what I've been students been doing the last year almost. Praying for that one person to come to God. Maybe this is the time where they can come into the house of God and maybe just get a taste of the things of God. So I invite you to come. Church, pray for that one person. Take that ticket and invite them. So I invite you first, come.